Hello and welcome to the breakdown. It is finally here. The All Blacks are chasing a three-peat of Rugby World Cup. It kicks off this weekend in Japan. On Friday, of course, Japan, they take on Russia. We've got the other eight. We've got them covered. Ali Williams, what, 2003, 2007, 2011. He was around a long, quite a long time. So John Kerwin, a couple as a player, a couple as a coach. Grant Nisbet, well, he did the last couple. He's done 300 and 13 test matches for the All Blacks. And John Hart, of course, coach and selector in 87, 91 and 99. So much to look forward to on tonight. So much debate. There's been plenty of it. It's time to get started. It all kicks off this Friday in Japan. It's almost a little bit emotional, isn't it? The fact we're finally here, JK. It's, I'm, it's no, I'm actually a bit nervous, to be fair. Well, about packing your bags for tomorrow morning as you go to Japan. <laughs> yeah, I haven't packed. You haven't <laughs> packed. Is that what you're nervous about? <laughs> yeah. You told me already you're turning left going onto the plane. It's not too uncomfortable where you're going. Correct. It's that pretty exciting. Correct. You do live the high life, don't you, mate? Well, <laughs> we're just sitting back here chipping away. Chipping away. Yeah. Nisbo, I mean, yeah. for you, you have so much experience in and around this game, the last couple of World Cups. You heard your voices there. The fact that it's, it's finally here, the fact the All Blacks are chasing history again. Jeff, I'm almost sick of talking about it. Uh, let's just play. Let's just play. There's been such a build-up. As you say, every four years, it is a special time in rugby, though. A lot of talk, though, Hardy. There's so much talk, so much conjecture, so much information out there. At, at the moment, it's just, is it time, like Nisbo said, just, let's just find out who the best team is. Let's, let's watch the next seven weeks and enjoy it. Well, I think the, the reason you've got all that conjecture is the fact it's a pretty even World Cup that there are a number of sides that really could compete this year and win it. Um, so I think, you know, it's a lot of excitement. And Japan is going to be really special. I mean, you know, I think Japan will do a fantastic job and uh, I'm looking forward to it. What about the, um, the fake news? Do you think that's crept into the World Cup in terms of... Have you been putting some out there? <laughs> no, 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 I've just Do you heard... know something we don't know? No, no, no. no, no, no. I've, I've just heard just that... Uh, Sonny Bill's got the flu. No, he's got chest infection. It comes from raw fish. It's quite a unique um, disease, um, but no one really knows what it is. It's just sometimes he won't be available for selection. Are you, you're trying to get in the papers No, again. no, what I'm saying is... Why don't you get in the papers for the right reasons? No, the, the question I ask is really more to John and John. Um, as a coach, do you put it all out there when you have your media um, conferences and all that? How much information do you actually put out? Because I reckon that fake news is creeping into our game. Well, I think the most important thing at that, at, at that level is that you try not to give away anything. I mean, there, was, there has been some spying allegations and I think that's settled down a wee bit. But you're not going to... You're so paranoid, <laughs> it's probably the right word, about making sure you get to game day with your players intact but also your tactics and stuff. That you are often not deceiving people but just not telling everyone the whole story because, for example, this week, um, you're not going to want... if Sonny was injured and we know he's not. I don't know where Hamish Mackay got that from, but, you know, if someone's carrying a niggle, you don't want them to find out until they really have to. I mean, interesting, in football, you name the team the morning of the game. Whereas, you know, and you know this, Ali, they name the team to the team on Monday. No one gets to see it. But the opposition, you don't want them to know whether we're going to play Sonny Bill or Anton Lena Brown until the very last minute. So you're going to play some games. It's all part of it. Well, that's really interesting for me because has, has a lot changed since the fact that, say, Luke Jacobson, unfortunately, and so disappointing for the young man, he's been ruled out, Hardy. They bring in Shannon Fazell. Did that maybe change their plans? Does that change their approach to this first test match against South Africa? And did that mean open up another selection discussion? Uh, I think it did, because I think Jacobson was there covering six, seven and eight. So for me, he was the ideal reserve to have on the, on the bench. So now that that's gone, they're going to have to cover that differently and um, probably use Severe at seven and, and beef up at six. 
<laughs> Nisbo, I mean, you look at, as these things happen, and you see it through Rugby World Cups, the fact there are going to be things that affect what happens later on. We'll talk about South Africa in a moment. How much about this week is really about the All Blacks? Oh, from our point of view, everything, absolutely. And, and there are, they left the country with a few guys under a bit of a cloud. We know Retallick's not going to be available, despite some uh, thoughts today that he might be, but I can't see that. But, for instance, do we know whether Goodhue is completely fit? Uh, Mwanga left under a bit of an injury cloud, didn't he? So, you know, there are some of these guys that uh, we're only going to know when the team comes out. Uh, uh, if Goodhue's not even in the 23, we'll know that he's probably not fit. Yeah, well... Exactly that. So the story will get Yeah, told. Well, I don't know about that. How can you leave Anton Lena Brown out? He's our most consistent you can't. centre and he's you can't. actually on the field all the time. But you can mm. use him at 12 or 13. Yeah. So yeah, you bring uh, him off the bench. Well, you could do, you can play him at 12, you can play him at 13, you'll yeah. bring him off the bench. He's the, he, how, he's the biggest certainty in the... In the um, oh, in the 23, but I'm saying he deserves to But you're right. He's the only bloke of those midfielders who's actually fronted up every time. He's been well. available. He's been available. Yeah. Let's talk about the loose fours then. Let's go back to that part of the game. The, the, where does Matt Todd fit into this picture? The fact that well, you shouldn't ask Gally because he said he shouldn't be in the side to start with a few weeks ago. <laughs> You're but right. But he is there. He is there. there. He is so there. you think well, about. I think it, now, I, now the dynamics change. Obviously, with Jacobson out, I was I was the same as Hardy. I thought Jacobson was that person, perfect person. But to me, Matt Todd, I think he's going to be the one that plays, not the impact, because I don't think personally and. Like anything, it's only my opinion. What he brings off the bench is slightly different from a Frizzell or um, even a, a Barrett. But so, I, to me... But it's, it. For me, I look at Sam Kane, you know, Kieran Reid, Nadia Savio, they don't run into gas, these three. I mean, that's the, the interesting yeah. thing for me, that, is the fact that they all impact the game very, very differently. Exactly, and that's why I think Frizzell's more likely to be the bench player because they know that Savia can go to seven to cover Kane and, uh, and they'll want to keep Savia out there for 80 minutes if they can. Yeah. So if they're going to make any change, I think it'll be around probably Kane maybe and Frizzell coming on into, into the blindside position. Oh. I think there's a bigger discussion that then changes your loose forwards. A and this is a theory. Oh, brace yourself, team. <laughs> Get brace ready yourself. for it. So this is my theory. If, let's say, Rico Ioane and Scott Barrett were the informed players up until Perth, when are you going to give them another crack at proving themselves? So if you say, I'm going to start Scott Barrett, what does that do to your bench? Because right? if you start to a Piloto and put Barrett on the bench, you cover a lot in six, which I... changes your first sale situation. I... And then are you going to give Ioane a crack because he's player of the year last year, he's had one bad game, and now you go, well... So, uh, when do you... Because well, you can't play him against anyone else. You can't prove anything. Well, uh, we people say, Tonga, Tonga, Tonga. With all due respect to Tonga, we love the Tonga. Do you know what I love about you, Jacob? But, uh, I love about the fact that you posed, like, six questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and well, which one would you like to answer? We're going to come back to that, because... Be we, we are going... <laughs> <laughs> we're going <laughs> Imagine being a player. Exactly. Coach, exactly. Mate, you wouldn't Imagine know what to do. Imagine playing for that. You wouldn't know what to do. We're going to come back to that. Give us a chance to process it. Let's go Let's go to Japan. Let's go to Kirsty Stanway. She's got her own show tomorrow night, 8.30. Big in Japan. Make sure you check it out. Kirsty standing by. And Kirsty, give us another perspective. It's uh, certainly not as windy as it was for the crowd goes wild a little bit earlier on. But are you ready? Are you primed and ready? And give us a different perspective perspective on this big game. Good evening. Yeah, not just me here. Hingani Shimanji. Did I? Yeah, Shimanji. That's right. Shimanji, Kirsty yeah. Stanway. I got your name right. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> We're outside the Sojoji Temple here in Tokyo. It's one of the most famous temples in Tokyo. There are people taking pictures all over the place, but we're here to talk about the game. You've just arrived in the last few days, but what sort of welcome have the Springboks received since I've been here? No, it's been incredibly phenomenal. Obviously, they were the first team to get here. Um, there a lot of events, I've, I've been told, from the mm -hmm. players. But they've loved every, every moment of it. A couple of the guys do play rugby here, so they're used to the conditions, they're used to the environment. But they're loving it. I think pretty settled down. I think like the rest of the rugby world, they just want to play the game now. Yeah. You know, enough of the fanfare, the chat and all of that. They just want to get on the field and sort business out. How big is this game for the Springboks? No, it's, it's massive. Look, it, it's an all-black South Africa test. It doesn't get bigger than that. Mm. People are saying the result doesn't matter. I guarantee you it does matter for the players. Those men on the field, you know, they want to get a psychological edge, be confident, you know, get back to work on Monday, knowing that they, they've beaten their, their rivals. Ali Williams has already talked about fake news and whether or not it's, it's creeping into the game. And today, Matthew Proudfoot, the assistant coach yeah. of South Africa, he was up and he said they're expecting to face Brody Retallick. Is that a bit of fake news? 
Yeah, look, I, I don't, well, I, from what I hear, is coming back in the quarters. Look, it, it does, a, it, you know, Retallick is one person. Mm-hmm. I think you've got to look at the unit as a whole. Scott Barrett's a fine player. Patrick Tupoluto has been playing well. Sam Whitelock is an absolute legend. So for them, I, I don't think you can isolate it to one player. I think that the combination of that it's an all-black team. They wear black jerseys, the best team in the world, uh, historically phenomenal at World Cups you know, World Cup holders, and, and that's the reality about it. And South Africa, there, there has been an improvement to the game. They've got good momentum, confidence, and probably the one team in world rugby that can mix it, uh, genuinely mix it with the All Blacks, away from home. They've been here for a few weeks now, a week longer than the All Blacks. What's their build-up been like for this tournament? No, it's, it's, it's been good. I think um, the, the chat was, you know, we played Japan and they you know, released a documentary about the, the Battle of Brighton or whatever. Mm-hmm. So they didn't want a sequel. So they, <laughs> the, so they, they made sure that they, they got the result and won that. And look, they, they, I, I thought they didn't even get into, you know, shift gears in that game. And it was pretty convincing. But it was more about adapting to the conditions. Um, you know, they've been pushed in, in terms of fitness uh, the, the last two, three weeks. And obviously tapering off and, uh, you know, this continuity, you know, you, you could probably select 90% of the Springbok team yourself. And, and that's what they want. So they're confident and they're just sitting out and just waiting for the event to start. Are the Springboks doing anything around the conditions? I've heard about how it could be wet on the weekend. It is humid, so the ball will be a bit wet as well. And other teams have been doing things like putting baby oil on balls and wearing boxing gloves to catch and pass. Have the Springboks been... balls, I hope, eh? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look, at the, 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 yeah, look, it's... it's you know, you, you compare the weather here. Yeah. Someone said um, it, it's basically like the, the humidity in Durban, but your times are about three or four. So it's, it's not foreign conditions. It's probably similar to playing a, a wet game. But, you know, the Springboks do have a, a pretty good kicking game, a good territorial game and, and a good pressure game. So it will suit the style they play. And, you know, you compare it to sort of a New Zealand team, whether it's Mwanga or Barrett. I know New Zealand can get pretty cold down there also. So both teams can adapt to it. And, and that's the reality of this World Cup. It's not, you know, you're going to have to adapt to the conditions, play a different style style of rugby and, and see what happens from then on. Talking about the style of rugby, in the last year and a half, it's been one win for South Africa, one win for the All Blacks and a draw. Are you expecting anything different from South Africa in this match? It's, um, considering the conditions, it's going to be, I think it's going to be a tight game. I don't think it's going to be a high scoring game. And, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult. I think it's only two points that, that separate mm. the teams. I thought the, the best game the Springboks had was the one they lost, actually the one in Pretoria where there were 30... 13 up in dry conditions on a fantastic day in Pretoria but yeah look obviously my heart will say South Africa you'll say New Zealand so you know I I hope the Springboks win but I think it's going to be pretty tight two three points in it. Did you have a word for your old sparring partner Ali Williams that's in studio? Yeah, look, um, hopefully everything gets sorted out at the Blues. You know, we were waiting for the good old Blues to come back. Yeah, but it's it's good chatting with you guys and uh, let the best team win this weekend. Thanks very much, guys. Talk soon. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks, Shimmy. Great to get some insight. I'm fascinated by what Shimmy said there, the fact that... Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. on. You want to retort? Hold on. John and I get one reply. (laughs) I write a reply. Now you see... The Blues are coming, mate. It's our (laughs) our year next year. Oh, he wants another go. Shimmy wants another crack at us. I think he's got a whole, him, lot, a whole lot of belief. Oh, yes, yeah, listening. You're listening now. Seriously. Okay, let's go yeah. back. Let's go back to you, Sh- Shimmy. Shimmy you've look. got to give us a chance, mate. The Blues, it's our year next year. Beware. <laughs> yeah, you've been saying that the last four years, though. <laughs> <laughs> and 14 years. Let's talk about fake news now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we will talk to you next week. We'll see who's smiling then. We will see who's smiling. Thanks, team. We'll talk <laughs> okay, to you soon. Cool, Outstanding. All right, let's talk about South Africa. Let's talk about the way that they play the game. They're coming into this test match. Faf de Klerk has already talked about this, Hardy, about the fact that they're going to kick and they're going to defend. Is that dangerous? Is, is that a, a high-risk proposition against an all-black team with the dangers that they have out wide? Well, that's the way they played it. But I think um, they will do more than that. Um, I, look, I, I think... They're a real danger on Saturday. Uh, uh, this game is one that I think can go either way. And I personally have thought for some time that this will be the final. I think who, this team, were, the, the teams that played it uh, in that game will play in the final. South Africa will bring a huge amount to it physically. And that means I think there'll be, you'll see some different selections in the All Blacks on the bench. I think the All Blacks will take a view that this is an 80 minute 85-minute game, whatever it lasts, it's going to go, it's going to be tough, and they will need a lot of experience and power on the bench. So I think that's where the change might be for the All Blacks, to try and withstand that total pressure. But, you know, 
you've heard you've heard um, Hanson saying all week, you know, they roll the dice and uh, they'll be ready for the South Africans roll the dice for the way they come up in defence and the All Blacks are going to attack them. So getting back to my question or my six Which questions. One? The, six que the six first one, one is, yeah. uh, so you'd prefer to start, well, I'm putting words in your mouth, obviously, you'd prefer to start with Barrett and then bring Tupolotu off the bench? Absolutely, play? because the line-out is crucial. And, and I think Barrett is a better line-out player than Tupolotu. And against the South Africans, we need to get our line-out ball. So tell me, X factor. I think we're so. Damien McKenzie is our biggest loss. So what? Are, so what are you going to do off the bench? Do we really have X factor off the bench anymore? Savier has actually proved that he can play like that for for eighty minutes, which is awesome. But do we have X factor late like well, we used to? Is that what? Well, we're I missing? think yeah. You don't have it in the Damien McKenzie style, but I I personally think they'll go with Ben Smith. Uh, off the bench because he has all the experience they're going to need when the, it really comes it's, to the crunch. That's exactly a point I want to make, Nisbo and, and Ali. The fact that we, you talk about the balance of getting it right, and it seems as though we've taken a late risk. We've gone with the two pivots. The fact that we haven't played Mwanga and Barrett together a lot. But in the benefit, you look at the two last World Cups, Nisbo, the experience of getting us across the line was, was critical. Leadership, all of those little things when a game gets tight, when it's not going your way. Yep, absolutely. And that's where the bench is. Is, is vital, and I agree with Hardy. I think Ben Smith comes off the bench for the last uh, 20 minutes or so. The fact is, you've got to play what you perceive to be your number one team against the Springboks. You can't fiddle around with out-of-form players, JK. Ioani, you've got to play your best team. So when are you going to give them another crack? Game Canada, not. Game up. Canada Namibia... It's Italy. not about giving them a crack this year. No, it's no. About winning. About so winning to me, Cup. I mean, I, I just screw up. How can you say that, Ali? Because you have been on the show saying that one of the best things that's happened with the All Blacks, and you've had the people come to you and say, "This is your game. You've got to, you've got to have a crack." All I'm saying is, that World Cup's different, right? Yeah. Completely different. But, but the thing is, these guys have played so their way. So has gone. Well, well, Reece yeah, is these your guys are, player right at the moment. Yeah, these guys have played their way into form. How Rico got to his position is, is his own issue. Yes team, how they went, blah, blah, blah. I, I agree and accept that. But these boys are informed players so and they're playing well. He is one Brid of the... Why but why don't you put Bridge on the bench you can, you can do play fullback and wing and come on and, and be no, your ex-factor? No. Yeah, look, we know how good Rico you was. Uh, oh, definitely. Was in his position, playing at his very, very best. We haven't seen that, in my view, for 12 months at least. The fact, him playing with confidence and doing things well. You've got a player out there who is in great form, who's got high work rate. You don't want guys who are second-guessing and trying to find their form. The form is there for me for George Bridge. The fact, Severo Roos is the same, the impact they can have on the game. For me to be saying that now, with them only playing, having played a couple of test matches, but that's that balance of the fact that... Look, I you, you bring up Nehemi on a scudder all the time. I all reckon the time. Rico Ione may well play his way into the semi-finals final. I'm not saying he won't be there, totally agree. but right now I don't think they will take the risk. They'll get it, let him get his form in the next few games. The first game we've got to keep with some momentum. We've got to keep Bridges out there and, and um, Sever Reese. They they deserve to be there. I think I only he can make his way in there through other games. I don't think this is the, the chance that you get him. I also I think Tupelo should start. I think that he's got an engine and he's starting to find his feet a bit more. And I think, and unfortunately this sort of goes off a bit of experience I've got when I. Graham Henry dropped me for the final. He said, look, I've just got to be honest with you, I think you're better on the bench than some of our other selection. And this is a whole team selection. This is not about you starting or someone else starting. So I think, to me, Barrett is better off the bench than Tupelodu. So I would start Tupelodu over Barrett this game. Regardless what we'll, happens, JK, We'll disagree on that. We yeah. can do yeah. that. Yeah. Exactly. That's the point of the whole show, yeah. is to disagree. We'd, we'd hate to think we all see the game the same way. <laughs> Absolutely. Our ability then, JK, and you've mentioned this off air a number of times, to adapt to a situation. How much does that factor in your selections as you start going through later on in the tournament, or even through this first game, the fact that we don't know the conditions on Saturday. We don't know whether it's going to be hard and fast, whether it's going to be wet. Have we got the squad, do you believe, to be able to change the way we play to beat the Springboks? Yeah, I think we do. I think Hardy's right, though. You, you won't be sitting there on Monday thinking it's going to rain. You're picking your best side, and that's the best side to adapt to whatever weather conditions. I think as a coach, I mean, when I was coaching the Blues, I'd get up in the morning and hope it was sunny because we're better on a dry field. I think we'd be better against... Was it always wet? Yeah, it was. For <laughs> three years, I couldn't believe it. It rained for three years. It, it, it actually poured. Yeah. It poured for three it years. Three years. Okay. So was, enough, he was a great coach. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think the interesting thing is that you pick your best side and they should adapt to it. And 
World Cups are really interesting because there's more pressure. There'll be more pressure on this game than any of some of these young players have played in. And the other thing is you've got to adapt during the game, right? Because South Africa will go, how did the Lions beat us? How have we beaten them in the past? So during the game, they might bring a couple of different things to it. So you've got to adapt. That's why I see Crotty at second five. Because he's adapt. a player that can adapt and do things differently, and, and, and I think that he, he'll be a very vital part of the team on the weekend. And his experience and leadership, having done it for a long time, not only for the All Blacks when he's had the opportunity, but for the Crusaders. So you, yeah. you think about all of those, Nisba, but I, the first game doesn't decide the, the World Cup. The last game does, right? Oh, yeah, the last yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, do but you I... think maybe... Can the All Blacks expend too much energy in week one? knowing the fact that you've got six more weeks to go? No, I, I think this is a game in isolation, quite frankly. And I, and I don't think they will be thinking to Namibia and Canada and Italy. And This is a game that has to be won, quite frankly. And they'll worry about what happens after that. We know they're going to win those games. We know they're going to make the quarterfinals. It's just on which side of the draw. So it's so important to win this weekend. Well, they won't beat Italy if we have the aftermatch function before the game. Because we were good at that. Yeah, but Italy are so bad at the they moment. They are bad at the moment. They're horrific. I agree with Nisbo. The, this is a game in isolation. Huge game. The, the only th and the only reason I'm talking about possibility of giving those guys that little bonus of saying, I'm going to play you, is because I don't think, you know, I, I don't know if you can really say that the other ones are really going to put us under the pressure that we're going to need. Because after this round, you are it's your final every week. Yeah, but well, you know? what you're not, we've got to factor in and coaches will do this, and is injury. And at the moment, these guys are the form guys. Reality is there will be injuries, and that's when people like Oni can play himself into, into the tournament. Remember, so, he, did, he wasn't available for yeah, Tonga. That's right. He was injured too. Yeah. So, you know, I, they'll be very wary about taking too many players in who haven't played a lot of rugby. You know, they will want the players that are in form now. That's the momentum that they brought in Eden Park to Hamilton into, and I also, into Tokyo. I also think we have to look at the uh, defensive side of the whole game in terms of what South Africa are going to bring and how we're going to defend and, and, and the referees. Man, there has been a lot of chat already. Yeah. A lot of chat. We need a break. We need to take a breath. The All Blacks, of course, have arrived and the fans love them being on site. World Rugby officially welcomed them this week with their capping ceremony. of Omar Tanashi, which is what we've really felt over these last few days. It's been fantastic, the welcome that we've had here in Japan. In New Zealand, we talk of Manakitanga, which is being grateful and, and gratitude for what we receive. And for the guys, we can't wait to get into this tournament and uh, really looking forward to it. Welcome on behalf of Rugby World Cup Japan 2019 to the All Blacks for their cupping ceremony. Amazing. Uh, we just got into Tokyo today, and um, as you can see, it's pretty awesome to have the fans out here supporting us. And it's cool to come to this, and it makes it a little bit more real. So. First Rugby World Cup is this everything you ever dreamed of and expected, and more? Yeah, you know, I'm not you know, trying to get ahead of myself and just trying to uh, you know, focus on the performance at the moment. While this is you know, very enjoyable and stuff, it comes down to you know what happens in the weekend. What's been the best thing so far? Um, I would say the people. Um, the people have been amazing. The people just hanging outside a hotel, just the supports have been amazing, yeah. Had a few ramen this week and uh, the food's awesome, so no, I'm just looking forward to it. In the middle of Tokyo this week, so we should be immersed in the culture a bit more, so can't wait. Rather excited to be there, of course, a couple of weeks last year preparing for this Rugby World Cup. The panel needs a break. JK and I are going to keep working at it. We're going to go to the chalkboard. We're going to talk about some of the changes the All Blacks have made already in 2019. I'll talk to you, JK, the fact that I got a sense earlier on in the season we were searching for something. We wanted to play the game. We wanted to play it from everywhere at high speed and high tempo. And teams sort of worked us out a little bit. Yeah, and I think when we win the World Cup, 
the learning, especially in Perth, and some of the things we're doing early in the season are really going to be important. So, you know, if you have a look at what we're doing here, what do you notice? We're inside the 22 trying to run it out, you know, and you just can't do that against the top sides. You've got to play a really, well, really measured game early, a good kicking game. This is a Blitzlow Cup game. Eight minutes into it, we're throwing it side to side, thinking ourselves we're going to run it from everywhere. Yes, the conditions were perfect, but teams putting pressure on us and forcing us into uncharacteristic mistakes. Yeah, and what you're saying is the conditions are perfect, but the conditions are perfect also for the defence. Closing the gate there, and then um, uncharacteristically little kicks that are just putting us under more pressure. Yeah. And that was the whole situation in Perth. Yeah, we, we, we tend to be that theory. Like I say, it looked as though we were searching for ways to break down the opposition defensively, but we didn't have the combination. Steve Hansen talked about it. The fact was we didn't have that uh, June series. So all of a sudden you talk about little execution pieces, parts of the game we weren't quite nailing. Yeah, but I also think, you know, do the mahi, get the rewards. And, and I think you've got to really, you know, knock down a team with your tactics. What we're doing here once again is we're playing complicated moves deep in our half and, you know, putting ourselves under unnecessary pressure. So we've got to be able to say, and this is what will happen in the World Cup, Goldie, is teams are going to come out and, you know, we're talking about, oh, what are, what are the All Blacks hiding? But also opposition will be bringing new stuff to you and you've got to be able to adapt. Running from inside your 22 early in a test match when you're trying to break down an opposition... Well, everyone's dangerous. fresh, everyone's on top of the game, everyone's pumped up for it. Let's talk about then what we know South Africa's going to bring, and that's going to be line speed and pressure. Yeah, well, I think if you, if you look at the, the games that we've lost, it's about this. It's about real fast line speed. The Africans did what the, 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 the Lions did and closed the gate and put us under pressure. So that is really hard to deal with early, and you've got to say, how are we going to deal with that? And there's a couple of ways you can deal with it. This is really hard to get your decision-making, get your moves, get your timing. What you'll see here is you'll see guys overrunning it, right, because you're just under so much pressure. You have to diffuse that pressure. And there are a number of ways that you can break that down. One of those is the fact you can kick to space, or you can get really direct on the way you go about it. Yeah, I think the kicking game's going to be really important, but you don't want to kick away all your possession because guys get frustrated. What you see here is they've gone straight, hard, and that's pulled the defence in. Watch again, the white lock, they're coming in on white lock, there's an extra man out wide, he comes in. Have a look at the eyes and the direction of one, two and three, they come in. If you can recycle that ball quick, look at the space out wide. You manage to score that, but that's what you've got to do. You've got to go down the close channels, try and pull that defence into you, and then the ball's got to be quick and go out and tack the inside channels. Plays like the likes of your Sonny Bill Williams, Anton Leonard Brown, your Ryan Crotties. They do so very, very well. So are you picking Sonny Bill for, to Am start? I, I've never said I'm picking Sonny Bill for this game. There's no doubt he's in the selection mix, but I don't think he's going to have an impact on this game. Well, it takes big performances to win Rugby World Cups. In 2015 at Cardiff, there was a certain quarter-final against a French team that every All Black fan, supporter and player wanted to see a strong performance in. Semi-finals. Welcome back to the breakdown. Well, Kirsty ambushed part one. Let's get Steph back in with us. Steph, what's in the news? Thanks, Jeff. In news this week, former Wales and British Lions rugby captain Gareth Thomas revealed over the weekend that he's been living with HIV for the past eight years. By speaking openly about his illness, Thomas said he hopes to educate and empower others in the same position. Now, Thomas just competed in the 10B Ironman in Wales and hopes to raise awareness and help combat the stigma around HIV. And the Six Nations has entered into an exclusive period of negotiations with private equity firm CVC to, to sell a stake in rugby's oldest championship. Now, the 15% share is supposedly worth a whopping £300 million. Now, the deal will obviously provide a financial boost to each union, but would mean partly surrendering control of the competition. Now, I don't think that that cash injection would go awry with 
the likes of Italy. What How it? exciting. Oh, that, you that, coaching that, Italy? Something smells there. <laughs> I mean, they've just turned down a big global... But that's just know, a mate. premiership, though. Yeah, but that's what that's no, off. That's the Six Nations. That's the Six, six Nations. nations Fifteen percent. So there's something of wrong with six that. Nations. So why do you think they voted the against that nations. big? Do you think that might have something to do with them voting against the big? Quite possibly, yeah, JK. Exactly. Well, that's wrong. But how happy are you if you're an Italian rugby down here? Yeah, good point. I mean, if you I mean, you think of JK. How much does that change? When you look about because the, they're they're not a broadcaster. They're looking. They're getting involved in the Six Nations itself. The landscape continues to change around the game globally, and somehow, somehow, the Southern Hemisphere has got to find a way to get involved. Well, Southern Hemisphere doesn't seem to have any power in the debate. That's the problem. I mean, it's dominated by the Six Nations and the home. They are looking after themselves, and I agree with J.K. and Ali. I mean, that that does worry you. That is that the reason why the global championship they didn't get off the ground? Because that was the answer for global rugby in terms of developing the second tier nations and the whole whole approach. So. Well, yeah, and the financial power that they wield is really dangerous for the rest of the game because. Mm. We as New Zealand fight above our weights, but look at Tonga and the other Pacific Islands that are really suffering. They are relying on world rugby to give them money with one tournament every four years. And the, and the financial power that you get, Rome, the city of Rome, the mayor loves it because every Six Nation game brings 12 million euro into Rome. I mean, what we don't realise over here, and you've lived it, Ali, is that, you know, there'll be 10,000 people that will fly to Murrayfield without tickets and just enjoy the atmosphere. I mean, it's huge. It's a huge tournament that generates incredible money. Dangerous for us. This is when we, as a you know, southern hemisphere, we need to be adventurous, because we're going to get left. It's either going to be a slow death or we're actually going to say, right, we're going to go forward. Why are they investing in this? It's got, it shows the money that's already been made. So why, if you look at it from a southern hemisphere point of view, why would they even consider bringing us in? They don't need us. They don't want us. So let's be brave. Let's create our own industry. Yeah. You see all these things happening around the game. How, how concerned do you get that, that all of a sudden there, there is that, it's like there's that gap, the fact that we are getting further and further away given the fact that at the last Rugby World Cup, the four semi-finalists were the four Sanzar teams, the teams that continue to perform on, at the highest level and can have the, should have some of the biggest draws. Look, uh, I was very interested when, uh, when, I think it was Hanson, after the Tongan uh, test, had a crack at World Rugby and said, and they came back and said, we've thrown X number of dollars. You can't buy your way out of these things. That sounds like a political party. Just throw money at it and hope that something will happen. Well, it won't. It won't. So, look, um, uh, can I ask a question? Who's CVC? Funnily enough, uh, my understanding is they actually bought Formula One. Who are they, though? They're well, they're a private of equity. Private, private, private of yeah, equity. Yeah, yeah. So all of a sudden you're getting people outside of the game who their investment, Hardy, at this type of investment, isn't a return somewhere down the line. So they'll, they'll, they'll be looking at this as going, you know what? And they've bought 15%. That tells you right now with the value, what the value probably sits at for Six Nations rugby. Yeah, well, which is why the Six Nations didn't um, want the global championship because, it's, you know, they've got it here. They've got the value. And, um, you know, Ali's right. In the end, the Southern Hemisphere has to say, well, we've got to create something different ourselves because I still think South Africa will go north sometime too. Yeah. You know, well, you've got to go with that's the money. Happen. So we and the really, time zone. The, interesting yeah. thing the time me. zone's against... Did you hear that? He said yeah. Ali was right. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we, we don't get that well, very right. often no, on the show. Because you guys are with some of the quality that, that I deliver. Like, we don't get that very often. Well done, mate. Well done. You know what annoys me about our game at the moment, and especially the Northern Hemisphere? We're professionals when we feel like it. Right? So if we we're a professional game, Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, New Zealand should be getting paid when a player gets taken overseas. Now, I know Ali might blow up about this because the players are saying, oh, no, it's... But we've invested in someone like Ali. We've invested in someone like Charles Piatel. And the Fijians and Tongas are the same. So we're professionals when we feel like it. Here's a question. Right? We need to go fully professional. And that means sharing the money. Here's, here's, Not keeping it all up north. Here's a question. Are the players on field, are they humble in defeat? But are we as an entity, as a leadership, actually humble in the fact that we're second best to the likes of your Six Nations as a tournament, to your likes of your England? By the results on the field, are we as a govern, you know, fishhead type of society, are we still humble enough to say, actually, 
yes, you've got the power. We're happy to work with you, you know to not, find a way. Do you know not what the English word is for fishy? You know, no, what is it? What's it like? <laughs> the, no, no. <laughs> the official, no, he doesn't. The official people, but what I'm saying is maybe it's yeah. time that the Southern Hemisphere people eat some humble pie and say, hey, guys, we accept your power, we understand your financial power, but we want to work well, with I totally the better of rugby. I yeah. totally disagree with that, Ali. I think it's the other way around. I think the ben, Northern Hemisphere... Why would you? Power speaks. No, but the, speaks. the Northern Hemisphere need to be a little bit more conscious of spreading the wealth to grow the game. They don't want to spread the wealth with us because we beat them all the time. They are spreading the wealth. They're giving it to the players through, your, through their club competition. Well, we'll see. Look, at we'll the, see look was... there was 14 players playing who aren't Scottish descent playing in the Scottish team. Do you think that Southern Hemisphere is not helping the Scottish rugby team? Well, we're doing it. Helping bit. them, yeah, We know we're, we're, we're doing it around them the team. world. That is a great way for us to look at the eye on the world. But let's return our attention to the Rugby World Cup. And let's look at Pool A. Let's talk about... They've got four pools. Of course, everyone's talking about what's going to happen quarter-final time, but there's a couple of pools, the traditional pool of death. This is Pool A, and, if, and that's why our game's so important this weekend, because if we win, we play the second place in, uh, of this pool here. Ireland, Scotland, Japan, Japan Russia... And so you're picking Japan? Yep. To come out of that with Ireland? Ireland, Japan. Well, the big game is the last game of the round, actually, and that's Scotland, Japan. Um, and, you know, by then, Japan could well be in the yep. tournament. Um, Ireland, Scotland is uh, not a straightforward game for Ireland either. It, so, um, and where do we see Samoa then, Nisbo? The fact that, that they're sitting in there, no one's been talking about them. The fact that they come over and they were pretty good against Australia uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, they played pretty well. They didn't play well in the Pacific Nations, did they? Um, look, logic suggests Ireland and Scotland, but every World Cup has its upsets. Mm. And we know what Samoa did way back. 91, was it? 91, yeah. Uh, and what happened with Japan beating South Africa last time round. So it's not clear cut, but logic says Ireland and Scotland. So you're saying Russia's got a chance? No. <laughs> <laughs> Great pool, though. Well, That's how all pools should be. Well, and very important, I think it's very important because it gives Japan, the home nation, an opportunity to get out. The fact they get to that every next level, they'll agree. have to be very... And the fact that it's the last game of the round is great. For the yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. absolutely. Pool B. Let's have a look at Pool B and what's happening on there and, and, and that one. And, of course, you know, there's so much for us to look forward to. The fact we know New Zealand South Africa... Reality is they're going to get out of here, uh, Hardy, um, for Italy and Namibia and Canada. Namibia and Canada are probably just really happy to be at the Rugby World Cup. Yeah, and Italy have been pretty ordinary. So it's very much, uh, this is clear cut, it'll be New Zealand, South Africa. The interesting thing is, which way you go, you know, New Zealand, if they win, they will face England in a semi-final. Whoever loses this game will go the other way and probably play Ireland and Wales and maybe an easier route to the final. So, you know, I actually still think New Zealand and South Africa, those top two teams, you've, are going to make the final. You've done the whole at-home thing, right? Yep. You've been, <laughs> worked it out and nutted it out. Yep. And... I think the sad thing about that, Paul, is it's really clear-cut. Italy yep. have been really, really poor for the last four years. And Canada, since Kieran Crowley left, mm. you know, have really gone backwards. They were so quarter finalists one year, weren't yeah. they, Canada? Yeah. We yeah. played them in 91. We yeah. played them in 91. And we, we struggled to beat them. But that, that's quite a sad pull for, for some progression. I mean, yeah. that's clear-cut, I reckon. The, like Nisbo said, it's who's first or second, and Hardy said which way you go through. Right. I think so the other way's now part of Now, at it. Paul C, let's see how this one... Looks, and this is the oh. pool where you go. England, France, Argentina, USA and Tonga. Cooler. France play Argentina on Saturday. Beautiful. That is a significant game, Nisbo, in the context of the whole World Cup about who's got the best chance to move on and, and go through. Because you'd expect England to at least get over the top of one of them. Well, the assumption after Super Rugby was that Argentina... Uh, we just the Hawares would just turn into Argentina and be a very good team. But that hasn't happened. I don't know what's, mm. what the problem is there. France, I'm always wary of France at World Cups. Really? I know, I know. <laughs> you are. Yeah. You are. Yeah. Yeah. What about the death they caused all of us <laughs> on this bloody panel? <laughs> but you're not on your own. No, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. I think what we can do is rule out the bottom two yeah. and then argue about the other three. And argue about the other three? How do you see that? Well, I, I think that Argentina or the Jaguares had one of the best kicking games and they did play well, but it's, Super is not 
Test match rugby. I'm the same. France, you never know what they're going to bring. They've had some ups and downs. But I think England are going to be really, really strong if Tuolangi could stay on the field. England, the context, France. The context of this changes for me. If Argentina beat France yeah, well, in the, the first game, yeah. then all of a sudden France go, well, we have to beat England. Yeah. Well, the France-Argentina game will determine who is the other team, I think. So, you know, that's a very big game. But in saying that, though, Argentina have done well against England in the past yeah. as well. Argentina. And whoever loses that game, their backs are against the wall, right? And then you could have teams... But teams that all win three games. Argentina have always done well against France when the majority of their players played there. That's changed over the last four years. They're now playing our hemisphere. Both those yeah, teams, but, yeah, Argentina and France, have, have a, each other. Have no, a just tradition of going deep into World Cups. Yeah, I yeah, agree. They're, they're, you know? they're better off playing against us than they are uh, playing over there, uh, in, in, my, uh, in my view. All right, let's have a look at Paul D. At the last pool of this year's Rugby World Cup, Australia, Wales, Georgia, Fiji and Uruguay. This weekend, Australia plays Fiji. Yeah, well, yeah. that's the game. I, I think... I think the All Black game is a big game, but Australia, Fiji, people... I, I've been so impressed with Fiji. I think they are looking far more structured. They are fitter than they've ever been. And I think they will really give Australia a shake on the weekend. I'm not saying they'll beat them, but I think it'll be a very competitive uh, game. Hardy, I'll go one better. Yep. And I reckon Fiji will beat Australia, Australia this weekend. I think that... Um, you, when, as a player, when you go into the World Cup, the first week is very, very um, theatrical. You get capping ceremony, you get a lot of all this sort of stuff and you've got to stay grounded. Well, we're talking to our mates across the ditch who are very hot-headed and, you know, love life. I think that they could drop the ball this weekend and I think the um, humble Fijian boys will run in there. It'd be magic to watch. <laughs> magic we shouldn't watch. forget that, the fact, like, say, so the first week, South Africa lost to Japan. Yeah. At the last Rugby World Cup. Well, they were on holiday in the south of England somewhere and they forgot to show up and Japan knew that there was an opportunity there. I, I look at that and I'm going, you know what, though? But Australia are a team, Nisbo. They go to a Rugby World Cup. They were, the, they were finalists four years ago. Yeah. They, they find a way to make things happen to, to make things work for them. And Regardless I don't think their the form going into 215 was that flash of memory mm. either, was it? Yeah. And, uh, and they, as you say, they emerged. Uh, I can't see Fiji beating Australia. I can't see it. No, I mean, you do play captain. the percentage. I think it'll be close. I think, it'll be close. Mm. I think yeah. they'll give them a game. Oh, well, I'm bold enough, yeah. like you young you say I, you think, I think that when you're, when you're coaching down the, down the ranks, so out of the top eight, you target one team okay. that you think you can win. We targeted France as the Japanese team here in 2011, and we had probably our best game of the tournament, and it could have gone either way late. Right, uh, Japan did it to South Africa. You know, the South Africa, you said, were on holiday. That's probably what happened coming late. But Fiji, if they're going to win one and have a great tournament, it's got to be, it's got to be that game. And so everyone's got one, right? So Japan are focusing on Scotland. You'd think Argentina are focusing on France, knowing the fact there's one game in pool play which could determine where they go and where they head to. Look, of course, we've got a vast amount of experience through Rugby World Cups on this show tonight. And, of course, there's so many great memories going right back to 1987. You were a selector and coach there, Hardy and JK, you were there, you were at Eden Park. Um, look, you, you, you talk about this game and th it was the start of something special, Hardy. Yeah, and that um, World Cup, obviously the Northern Hemisphere were opposed to it initially and, uh, you know, everyone wondered how it would be. <laughs> They're still was... opposed to everything, right? But Absolutely, anyway. but, you know, first game, Italy, um, 15,000, 20,000 people. I think it was only 13 and a half. Yeah, well, I mean... What happened, uh, coming off 86, which was a pretty hard year for the All Blacks with the Cavaliers, uh, rugby was split, and the World Cup brought New Zealand rugby back together, and you saw it grow throughout the tournament. And that first game, it was quite disappointing to see the sort of crowd, but then to see what happened in the later games. I think fantastic. there was like a 75 metre try that changed a little bit of that. 77.2, 77. I think. 7.7.2. I thought I started on the number two, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, no, seriously, it was, it was um, an absolutely amazing thing to be involved with because it, it started really flat. We yeah. didn't know what we were getting ourselves into and the momentum, you could feel it around you. From driving to the final and the streets being lined and a helicopter, you know, and the first game, 13 and a half, 14,000 Eden Park, guys... You know, not that interested, and then boom, and just living that whole. We thought, wow, we're actually part of history. This is going to work because the Southern Hemisphere were four World Cups, Northern no. Nisbo, every World Cup's different though. When you go then to '91, you go to Northern Hemisphere. '95, it's just about to go professional. '99, then 2003, we had some rights. Then it went all over to Australia. The fact that that there's always a different storyline. The game continues to change. England, not one. They've won one title, just one. 
the one World Cup title that they've got. So there's been a transformation of the game over time. Oh, no question. I mean, you, you guys have talked about 87. 91 um, was kind of a little more established. 95, it was the re-emergence of South Africa. It was, it was fantastic. But, uh, you know, as you say, they're all unique in their own way. I, I thought the last tournament in the UK, 215, was a fabulous tournament. You were there for most of it. And, uh, and, we, and we staged a great tournament in 211, and Japan is different. It's different. And so uh, it's not really a rugby country as such. It's probably the first time that it hasn't gone to a, as, a, as a, an established rugby country. So it's going to be interesting, So actually. what does that change for you, Ali? How does that change things? Oh, I just think it's the evolution of the game. From professionalism, it's the evolution. It changes. I mean, the numbers, when Japan beat South Africa, what was it, 28,000 watched that game? The, the week after they played was something like, what is it, 28 million people watched it. So, yes, it's the evolution, it's the change of the game. I think Japan is going to offer a whole new dynamic to what is we call rugby. And, yes, we're embedded in it, we live it and we breathe it, but these people are going to add something new to it. We can already see it by some of the experiences, the footage, everything's coming out. So, to me, it's a good thing that it's going to Japan. Hey, in eight weeks, we'll be sitting here and going, look, look where rugby's going to now. Yeah, I mean, you look at, you look at, uh, you're saying the footage. I think the most telling footage I saw this in last, in tonight was Wales, uh, where they were training. The, in the local area had taken them in as their team, as we did with teams here in New Zealand in 2011. 15,000 Japanese people watching a, a watching train. a Welsh training run singing the national anthem for Wales. I mean, that is fantastic. Do you think the Japanese That's... would have had to go to Sunbeds well... before they went there just to <laughs> pretend that they were Welsh? I don't know. <laughs> I think 85% of the tickets are already sold. All of the All Black games are well and truly sold out. So I say that going to this uh, environment, you knew that you were going to get support and it's going to be there, I'm sure, for the whole seven weeks. Well, of course, it takes some great performances to get across some tough opposition in Rugby World Cups in 2015. The semi-final against South Africa was no different. Well, welcome back here. Yeah, so much attention on this year's Rugby World Cup. We shouldn't forget the Bite of Ten Cup is in full swing. There's been impressive uh, performances. Another great uh, game on the weekend. I want to talk about it first and foremost. North Harbour versus Tasman. Uh, Tasman have been impressive all year, uh, Hardy. But they've got a super rugby squad. We, we sort of see that. They've lost Shannon Frizzell, they know. He's gone to Rugby World Cup. But for North Harbour, it was nice to see Carl Tunukuafi getting some quality game time, and he seems to be making some real positive strides. Yeah, I, I mean, the uh, North Harbour scrum surprised me. They played really well, and uh, I thought they should have won the game. They probably just yeah. couldn't quite close it out. But I think Carl had, you know, and, and so did uh, Malafeo. They were very good in the front row. It's so, nice to think that's the Blues front row next year. It's good. It? It's, it's the good. Blues front row next year, Ellie. Looking good, looking on. good. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep chipping away with them. Play, play Ali, you want to come back? No, Hardy, I He hasn't not. been asked that ever on the show. That's the, we I don't think about, I could do it. Actually, after each show, we ask him about, about coming back. It's Let's, the importance of selection, Goldie. Oh, the selection. The selection. What, what leaving of, Carl no, out of the All Blacks, so he's not the bench, North Harbour? What about the, the bench? bench. The, the most important selectional issue this week, Goldie, is whether, when... Will Sky Sports come off the bench for uh, Spark? Uh, and, uh, what do you think? Uh, to host. Soon. How do we as think? soon as we possibly can. Nisbo, <laughs> okay. you were very unkind in your commentary on the weekend because Wellington thumped North uh, Otago by about 50 points and you keep, you just, I could see the glee, I could hear it in your voice. I was just trying to tell the truth to you. <laughs> <laughs> it was the truth too. But actually, really, I, I just I, ask you, I don't know whether you've experienced this because you probably never had the Ramfilly Shield, but when a team's got the Ramfilly Shield and... You, I can open myself up for that. Yeah, and when they play a game that doesn't affect them in We're, terms of the Ramfilly Shield. They're just not home, are well, they? Well, we're no good on... There's no roof. There's no roof there. Didn't it's need a roof. Fine. It was the no big roof. No players, mate. They didn't mate. plan for, JK. It they didn't plan for the day. sun. They didn't plan for the sun in Wellington. That's what happened. Yeah, that but a, happen, a right? good side... Nisbo's right. A good yeah. side doesn't just get up for the Ramfilly Shield. That's what they're doing. Yeah, well, I, I think there's some teams... I think Wellington, though. They've put themselves up there as a, as a contender. It, they started get... really, really badly, yep. but they've, they've come right. A big game this weekend, Wellington-Auckland. Wellington-Auckland. Auckland need to be better than they were. Steph, the good, the bad and the ugly.
Yep, so we're going to start with the good this week. And I know we normally give you a bit of stick, Ali, but we're going to start with the good. And we found this photo of you. <laughs> Well, he's posted this everywhere. <laughs> he posts this. This, this is his screensaver oh, oh. everywhere. What do you mean? There's 40 and, uh, other people. Just, remember this? <laughs> Where's the credit? There he is. <laughs> How many oh. minutes did you play? Three. Who were you covering? <laughs> Who were you covering, though? I mean, that'd be. Oh. Uh, Richie put the um, trophy in front of my head. <laughs> Yeah, but and you I was just like, put I your body in front of someone else. Really. Look at that guy's that. never going to be yeah, down in history because you leaned in front of him. Oh, who is it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> who is it? They're going to try and show it? that to their grandchildren. Oh. He, he's, re he's receding. I can fix that. Good for yeah, it's okay, awesome. okay, we're going to move on to the bad. So the bad was John Mitchell's quote following the 2003 World Cup. Now he said, We bombed out of the World Cup on an intercept pass. One pass, Ellie. Yep, no, he's correct on that. Oh, we lost. Played, we played extremely well in one pass. One pass. Well, Come who on, got to blame? Graham Henry wasn't there. We, John Mitchell didn't want to be blamed, so, <laughs> well, so we have to blame someone. Man, that's so unfair. I think that's it so is. unfair to put it on one player. I agree. I agree. I'm I not agree. sure they did play all that well, to be fair. No, no. <laughs> I, I agree with you, Nisbo. Now, <laughs> reflecting, I don't think we played that well. But I mean, I think, to be honest on those things, it's hard the coaches take all the heat. I don't think the players take enough responsibility in 2003. I don't think we did. In 2007, I don't think we did. In 99, you definitely didn't. So you probably need to stand up. <laughs> All right. Ugly. Let's go to ugly. ugly. Have we got something ugly? Ugly. 2007 Rugby World Cup. Oh, yeah. Cup. You were there uh, for worst... that too, were you? <laughs> 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 These are all me. <laughs> Let's hope there's no repeat, and that was our worst performance to date. Yeah, out the quarterfinals. Do you think we're talking about Richie's ugly fingers or Graham Henry's... Grumpy face. <laughs> John. Which is the ugly one? John, we've been there. We have. Let's move on we very, very no, quickly. I don't think, Those I are don't... conversations we don't oh. want to have. We need to do the notice board. Oh, okay. It's important. <laughs> it's important. It's important. OK, the so if you board. want to hear from our expert panel before kickoff, make sure you watch our Rugby World Cup show, Big in Japan. The promo is tomorrow night and the match day show is on Saturday. Mertz is up there. Robbie Deans is up there. Jean de Villiers. Thank you so much, Steph. Right, team. Well, quickly, we've got 30 seconds. Who's doing what? What are we winning by or losing by on the weekend? We we'll win by eight. JK, for you? Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be a big win. Uh, one or two. Agreed, yeah. I think we win, but not by much. Oh, this is and for you, Hardy? I want to sit on the fence, a draw. You're going to sit on the fence? Oh, a draw? Oh, what does a draw a do? Punter. Oh, cool. I, you've got I, I want to draw does. I think the All Blacks will win by three. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Ali Williams, thank you as always. JK Nisbo, great to have you on the voice of the All Blacks. Hardy, as always, thank you so much for joining us. It's all on this weekend. Friday it starts. Saturday, the All Blacks, South Africa.